Hi, Matze. Hi, Fio. Hi, everybody. A product line like the SL series isn't invented overnight. In fact, it marks a significant milestones in sound reinforcement system evolution. As such, it joins together and combines various paths of development and sub-products. These bits and pieces, which have been launched as individual items on their own for quite some time, have finally been combined and to our great delight, actually unveiled the masterpiece of the entire SL series families. And all that, exactly five years after our first conception. Well, with the release of the SL series and its comprehensive set of features, many of these individual parts of technology are joined together to create the most complete line array system. It not only consists of the hardware itself, but also of several supporting technologies, such as simulation of performance on-site as well as off-site, and sophisticated processing to precisely match performance to the individual application. Furthermore, it provides a full self-contained ecosystem for all aspects of system application, from transport solutions over the deployment and commissioning through fast and safe rigging solutions, up to system integrity verification functions. Okay, let us walk you through 40 years of DNB history and take a closer look at at least two of these evolutionary branches on a timeline. First, the obsession to control directivity, and second, the series of enabling technologies. So, Marty, let's talk about the early days, the early 80s. Of course, we built some funny stuff. We designed our own mid-range horns and used industrial available HF horns. And so the F series was born. We combined it with the first integrated controller electronics, as you might have seen in your early days. Um, a matching point was the 1220 loudspeaker system, where the journey actually started with the controlled directivity. Uh, we were playing around with the first ISO bars available. We had the first simulation tools on computers with more or less prototypes of what's known today as the e-simulation product. We got TEF ETC measurement computers did our measurements to validate what we actually were simulating. And it was about predict planability and predictability of the result. And uh, apart from that, the thing sounded, of course, absolutely outstanding by the time. And this was kind of the start of the journey of the two-way active F1220 systems. It was the perfect tool for the times for consultants, for theaters, for opera, for classical stuff, for broadcast, for conference intelligibility. And this is where that obsession on directivity control started. But maybe you did some of your own experiences by that day. Uh, well, of course, in the 80s, that was way before my time at DNB. So the only thing I can contribute here is some well, report from the application. Um, well, as an occasional young sound engineer, I had the chance to work on some uh, corporate shows and TV events uh, now and then. And the interesting thing was when there was 1220 in use, there was something noticeably different. There was a better intelligibility, especially when the room was quite reverberant. And this was quite obvious after just a few seconds of uh, comparative listening, that this product is superior in, in some way, somehow. And this was the learning of that day. Um, well, afterwards, um, I understood that this had to do with directivity, and, um, but it can be a very valuable and powerful tool to increase performance. We started the 90s by designing our series, what we call series O2, two-way passive uh, top mid-range cabinets, full-range cabinets, which was crowned in 1994 with the 402 systems, which was a squared box horn and horn designed with 40 by 40 degree dispersion control down to 600 hertz. And this was more or less our really entrance into the international mobile market because by the time this was a demand there on such a system. At that time, I was still on the user side. Um, 
a bit more professional already, uh, but still as a student mainly. Well, I was for well, summer long touring uh, over Europe with exactly this system. And um, well, I personally uh, took some learnings from there. Um, well, one of the first thing, of course, that a precise directivity has to come with a precise rigging system. That was a kind of a tricky and funny thing at the time. Um, the other thing was the horn-in-horn -horn design um, from the well, from the electroacoustical side. It was the horn-in-horn -horn design, and uh, well, the peculiarities and the specialties and what to obey and what to get from this. Well, I think in the end one can say that the um, C4 system, which was it called after uh, a while, after a renaming. Um, the C4 system has actually been used in applications much larger than it has been designed for intentionally. And uh, of course, there is some, some learning as well, what it needs in terms of system headroom over frequency in order to serve all these larger uh, events that has, been, that has been done with the C4 system. I mean, talking about uh, predictability and preciseness of rigging, I think that's where we started with our first Transcalc simulation product to know exactly how to fly the C4 systems, which was quite a complicated process, we have to say. But anyway, this helped us to establish our global role in the mobile and touring market. At the Millennium, we were kind of working on different things and one of the most successful series we ever did, the Q series, where we, yeah, we always said that's the best combination of compromises, as we said in those times. So we combined line array technologies, we combined point source technologies, but what we were really, really keen on to control as much as possible directivity in one direction with a Q-series, at least in the horizontal direction down to 450 hertz. Well, of course, this was a big advantage um, again in the application when it comes to intelligibility in the mid-range, especially in the vocal range. Um, well, technically what was behind is a wide overlap um, of, the, of all available components with a special crossover design. Uh, interesting story to remember. Um, there was a shootout event in a reverberant room, in a large reverberant room, where the interested customer um, compared several line array systems of that time. And the task was to read from the newspaper with some headset microphone. And it was really impressive how the, the difference was like room, reverberant part of the room switched on or switched off, depending on the system that was in charge at the moment. I remember, I think, Going back from this thing on the train, we had another idea, but we will, we will come to that a little bit later. All in between, we wanted to uh, talk about the Q-series subwoofers and um, well, some technology, some enabling technology that came up there. Well, it was the cardioid subwoofer array, the CSA, CSA yeah. option that was introduced with the Q-sub system. Um, well, it worked perfectly from a technical point of view. It had one weak point. The weak point was that it was built up uh, modular with uh, three individual, basically omnidirectional subwoofers, and you had to apply the processing uh, depending on uh, well, the front side or the rear side channel. And this enabled something that was quite uh, difficult to handle. Um, the user could add individual knowledge and individual ideas and these ideas have not always uh, worked well, out contributed to the best so um, our learning at that time was uh, it's better to integrate this into one system into one physical hardware uh, in order to get a predictable and reliable performance generally speaking it, it uh, improved the flexibility of the whole system and it was more or less one of the first step into what we call that enabling technology by the click on the amplifier controller you can do something completely different with uh, at least three of those subwoofers and reduce energy going to the back of the array let's proceed to 2006 apart from the uh, Soccer World Championship in Germany, there was another really, really very important date. We launched the J-Series, 
which was a two-way active design, large-scale line arrays. And again, uh, this uh, was a landmark for DNB uh, and also a technical landmark through the techniques we applied in terms of horizontal dispersion control, the crossover designs, the, as you mentioned before, the cardioid principle integrated in the subwoofers. Also in terms of prediction, we went to the next step, uh, ArrayCalc. Well, it marked the beginning of the uh, ArrayCalc software being a standalone application and uh, while well, helping people to apply this stuff in the most advantageous way. Uh, paired with a uh, rigging procedure uh, and the patent and rigging procedure in three points, which still is basis of the today's rigging on the SL series. Well, yes, in fact, the, the rigging system of the J series is the grandfather of what we still have today, yeah. which has been developed further on. Yeah, and which was uh, our start into really packaging and set up and set down procedure. And this really uh, rocketed DNB, our brand, into the major events on the planet. Well, there is a funny story we could add here. Um, of course, the, we spend a lot of effort in creating some uh, good dispersion and also some very good uh, looking isobars. And um, well, I had a very high resolution uh, printout of the isobars of a J series, um, as well as a V series later on, um, and uh, printed that out and put it on the wall next to my office desk. And many people came in and asked, ah, you were quite proud of these. Um, and I said, um, well, yeah, I didn't comment at the time, but in reality it was just there um, to show me uh, each day I come to the office what still needs to be done, the frequency range below 300 hertz. To get control over that because that's still radiating omnidirectional more or less. Well, in the end it was the, well, directly after J-series, the thinking into how can we get full bandwidth, how can we get broadband in the directivity, the thinking process started. Yes, and it took a couple of years and a couple of other product line, very successful ideas, until we got there. Actually, 2008 marked another nice little product, but actually it was a really technological challenge, the passive cardioid before subwoofer. How did that go? Well, first of all, um, it helped us a lot. This, this passive cardioid technology helped us a lot in really deep understanding how to create directivity out of multiple sources uh, in one box. Um, well, the funny thing was in the beginning, uh, we thought we couldn't explain why it shouldn't work, um, but we thought this can't work because if it would work, someone would have done that already because it was basically a technology, it was a thing that was clearly lying on the table. You just had to pick the, the pieces and put them together. And so we couldn't explain why it, it shouldn't work. So we thought, okay, we have to build it to see why it doesn't work. And then, um, well, it worked. <laughs> Didn't we make a bet out of it that it won't work? I can't remember. But any, anyway, it ended up in a patent, which is still valid, the patent of uh, one channel amplification cardioid subwoofers, right? Yeah, single channel, single amplifier channel, um, cardioid dispersion, multiple sources within within one box. And after we, re we realized that it really works, this very efficient single channel passive cardioid subwoofer things, we went for a patent for that. And this marked for us a really great idea technologies which we were using in other subwoofers and other product lines year after year, like the V-series, like the Y-series, or install-specific 27A subwoofers. The next years were basically full of product development after product development, line after line, uh, Y-series, V-series, amplification, we worked on improving array car simulation and remote software, but all over the time we had one thing in mind, right? To go further into the direction of constant directivity control over the whole frequency band. Well, picking up this, uh, well, technological evolution, this development process in creating directivity, uh, well, f uh, led us to the development of the SL series. And in the SL series, 
we kind of reached a milestone of the full broadband directivity. So the entire bandwidth of the top is under control. And well, the method how to create this um, was basically a development out of the things that happened before. And it was a logical and uh, consequential development from there. And um, but for this method, we got a patent granted how to do this, how to create directivity out of multiple sources within uh, one loudspeaker box. And the whole long year development of the SL series idea was paired with a set of enabling technologies and other milestones, which we will talk about as next. So let's have a closer look into the DNB enabling technologies, a series of technologies, features, parts of the systems, programs that helped over the years to get to a better performance, to better monitoring, setup, planning our system designs, and that, that's an ongoing story. And as you will see, it's re also very related to the whole SL series development story. Well, I think this uh, story started with the um, calculation, the simulation software for line arrays, uh, the QCalc um, in 2003, uh, which was based um, as a basically calculation spreadsheet on Microsoft Excel. And um, well, it quickly migrated into a standalone application, uh, which is now known, still known as the DNB array calc software. And well, there was a there came up a demand for uh, well more precision in uh, mechanical applications and mechanical setup of the arrays and the associated acoustical output and uh, project this onto the listening planes. And well, this was basically the start of the DNB own simulation software, uh, which was around 2008 or so. That science and parallel to that, of course. Uh, one wanted to remote the whole systems with the, so a remote concept was necessary. Also the R1 remote software. One next significant step was the, uh, the specification of a four channel amplifier along with a V series in those times, the T80 amplification and DSP platform. We had stuff in mind. We had something to do and we had some visionary input into that. Maybe you want to take on from here? Well, there are a few things that we uh, put into the D80 amplifier. First of all, it was the amplifier itself. So the uh, high available output voltage that we put in there because the development um, at that time, which went more or less in parallel with the V series. This, by the way, marks the beginning of this change in paradigm of loudspeaker technology, of loudspeaker uh, design. Um, we changed from a well, the more classical approach, thinking of uh, well, directly usable or useful um, sensitivity and frequency rate response out of the loudspeaker design itself. We moved to a more efficiency focus. And in order to do so, uh, we needed to change the specification of a new amplifier. First of all, towards higher output voltage. Secondly, we needed a more sophisticated limiting structure to control this. Additionally, we already had some uh, further processing in mind and uh, well, a very wise decision. We put in enough resources on the DSP side, on the processing side, uh, to later enable uh, the FIR filter response, which uh, led, uh, led us to array processing later on. Yeah, which was basically two years later. But in order to go to array processing, we also needed to have a uh, very fast remote protocol to get all the data that reprocessing would have to send to the amplifiers in place. This was the OCA control and later developed to AAS70 protocol standard. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, uh, of course, there was a demand uh, to transfer um, a huge amount of data within a super short time. If you want to uh, recalculate an array, an array processing slot, you have to distribute this data to the respective amplifier channels. And so a lot of data within a super short time, as short as possible. And this meant we needed a well powerful enough protocol to do this safely and reliably. So that's another explanation of how we were working, built 
one thing on the other. To do that, we need to do this first. And we're talking here in time frames of three to five to six years, where we build up this pretty revolutionary array processing technology, a technology to largely improve the performance of a line array systems in a pre-given room with some freedom to tailor your result. In 2015 saw the introduction of DNB array processing, one of the most powerful DNB enabling technologies. It is still a unique feature by today's standards. Array processing defined the new industry standard in democracy for listeners and adaptable reinforcement quality only by not linking the top cabinet within an array and supplying a specific set of FIR filters to each cabinet and amplifier channel. The simulation and calculation of cabinet-specific array processing filters is done in a section of ArrayCalc and supplied to each channel by accessing the respective common project file from the R1 remote control software. Array processing means creating directivity on purpose for a given audience geometry and a desired level distribution. Application of array processing as standard means a shift in requirement for a new product line in mind. Of course, these requirements have been obeyed and applied in SL-series designs from the very beginning. Array processing, for example, created a huge lifetime extension to J-series until the launch of SL, creating an additional phase of return on investment in the global market. In 2016, we actually looked on the environmental side of live performances, especially in open air events. What then was uh, introduced as the noise calc simulation software actually started a couple of years earlier with some experience we did out in the field. Well, in fact, we met a new group of people um, on the Wacken Open Air Festival, the heavy metal festival in the north of Germany. Um, suddenly there were noise consultants showing up and these people, uh, well, what was their intention? Uh, in the first instance, we thought about, um, well, they want to destroy the fun on the festival, uh, but well, let's be open and let's uh, join the guys and see what they are actually doing. So we um, went with them, uh, tried to understand, well, and finally uh, gathered, got some understanding and, and got some experience on uh, what they are doing and what the actual problems were. There was another funny story that we can add here. Um, in one of these festivals, there was a monitoring position in a resident area. And after, well, the, when the sun went down and something in the, en in the environmental, in the atmospherical setup changed, and uh, well, maybe some, some change in the wind direction. And suddenly one of these monitoring positions, someone called, hey, we are having a problem in this and that frequency range and um, we are uh, filling up the, the levels that are allowed. And well, we started some hectic recalculation on the, well, at that time, available uh, software platform on ArrayCalc. And um, well, we, we thought, okay, this must be this and that um, lobe that going to the side that must have uh, changed the direction due to the change in wind speed. And um, we tried to realign between the different part of the system, so the large subwoofer array and, the, and all the main hangs, and changed a little bit there, which didn't make any difference to the audience, but made a huge difference in exactly this monitoring position. Well, in reality, we were, we were cheating on a quite high level. Um, we were moving this lobe into the neighbor's garden where there was no measurement position, but it was a quite impactful learning. Um, we understood about the possibilities that we have in our hands just by realigning the system and understood that this could be useful in a, an appropriate um, prediction software. Which was more or less a try and error thing, what we did in those times. But over the years we thought, is there a way how you can predict and simulate those effects? And of course, uh, that's a very, very complex topic and we found a company that partnered up with it, the company Soundplan, and they are the real experts in calculating this very, very complex environmental far field issues which depend on weather, wind speed, objects, and all, all kind of that. 
Maybe some more details from your side? Well, the funny thing is in the beginning when we launched the software, um, a lot of people in the market, in the pro audio market thought, now at DNB they are completely crazy. Now they take care about the environmental noise issues. And uh, well, a few years later then, they understood why we went that way. Um, well, once we had this topic under control, then this software, this piece of software proved to be enormously helpful For us, it's much more than just a piece of software. Of software, we are um, trying to save the future of open air live events. They will go more and more into urban places. There are more regulations, and the environmental idea of noise pollution comes much more into play. And noise calcs up to now is a complete unique software where we can do predictions based on international standards and actually the service provider or the promoter can take these predictions and go to the local authority and prove that they do everything that they can do to protect the neighbors. And this was part of the beginning of the more art, less noise story. Noise Kalk in 2016. All along these years, starting from 2014, 15, 16, especially 17, we were actually already working on the SL series feature set. We defined the features, made the specification, and then started working the different tasks on. Of course, this, as mentioned in the very beginning, this is not a thing in one or two years. So we added another set of enabling technologies in 2017, the array verification. Of course, we needed also time to do the field testings and uh, go out with the systems and learn the rigging, verify all the mechanical parts of it. And this was how 2017 went by. 2018 SL theory hits the road. After pre-launch for a selected number of people in late 2017, in 2018, we launched officially the SL series with its first system, the GSL system, the Große Special Loudspeaker. This was a complete new thing in the world, full broadband directivity control rigging system, very powerful. The LF energy there, everything that we specified before so it became clear that all the work, the enabling technologies and the stuff we worked before, including noise calc and array verifications, the packaging and all, finally culminated in the SL series in that year, the GSL system. Well, and now that finally we had the full broadband directivity, I could remove the to-do reminding isobars from my office wall. I will not tell here what took this place. Yeah. <laughs> GSL was introduced into the market globally in really good quantities, so it made available for each kind of event and service providers. In certain instances and presentations, we already mentioned that we would like to try to bring the GSL into a smaller format. What then ended up to be the KSL, the Kleine Special Loudspeaker, a year later in 2019. Well, in parallel with the KSL and KSLI, we launched the new amplifier generation, the D40 and 40D amplifiers. Um, from a system, from a system overview uh, perspective, this means harvest time on our efficiency thinking. Um, we mentioned before that around 2012, we changed the loudspeaker design paradigm towards a pure efficiency thinking, so conversion efficiency from the electrical to the acoustical domain. And now with this amplifier, we can exactly uh, get the benefits and bring these to the market and to the application. And it's quite a very interesting and very uh, well heavy saving that we can have here. Um, if you compare to older school systems, to traditional designs, we can achieve the same spectrum and level with approximately half of the electrical energy consumption. And this is quite a big improvement, I'd say. Yeah, that's another step in our thinking into the future. Mm -hmm. 
what happens, the eternal ongoing question, can it even go smaller? To be honest, we thought about that for quite a while and against a lot of odds, what happened in the world at that time, 2021, 2020, and a lot of uh, cabinet research, we actually managed to get that package towards the XSL, the extra kleine special loudspeaker, and launch that lately to the market. Well, we had to investigate into new cabinet materials. That was quite obvious at the, at the first prototype stage already. And um, well, we used the time of the lockdowns and the pandemic to do so. And uh, well, finally, we optimized the system even further uh, towards scaling it down again. Yeah, once the moment we were able to go out again and do shows with it, we were really, really thrilled by the performance of the little, of the smallest brother of the SL series. Well, actually it over exceeded our expectations. Yeah, that's true. And it's by now really, really hard to satisfy the demands in the market. Well, in fact, <laughs> that's one of the more luxury problems a manufacturer can have. Yep. So what about the future? I mean, now that the SL series definitely is finished, there will be no more SL series family members. What's going on? I mean, we are, of course, looking forward to carry the enabling technologies on better simulation, better planning, better handling, better workflow, and invest a lot in that, which is not only good for SL series, also for all other DNB products. Stay tuned. Well, of course, we are already working on some, uh, well, enhancements on the enabling technology side. I think that's what we can say here. And um, well, concerning the properties of the SL series, we are thinking that the SL series is a comprehensive series now. So we have, um, we think it's finished and done. Um, but of course, it's a, set of features, what we are talking about here. It's uh, first of all, it's the full range broadband directivity. Then there is things like uh, the rigging systems and so on. Um, of course, we are thinking of how to bring these features to other applications, um, to other systems. And we will see, we are um, investigating into this and let's see what the future brings and it will continue. Well, not all of us plan to retire soon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. Do you remember us driving back in 2013 from the Wacken Open Air, where we had our first peace stop? Actually, there we decided that five years later, we can have a complete brand new systems with sets new standards, with looks in the environmental stuff, broadband directivity control, and all the specifications we have in mind and the topics in mind. It's, it's actually, we made it. Well, we even made it in time. We launched in five years later, we launched the GSL, so the first member of the new series. And um, well, in the end, it was a, a great combination of uh, well, technology, engineering, and ambition mm -hmm. uh, that came to a successful end. And, uh, and there is more to come. Let's watch out for the future. Mm -hmm.